I think um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone. I am Sherry Arts Gilbert from WCET. Um, thank you for joining this roundtable discussion. What I wish I would have thought about before adopting a tech product. Um, we have two chat options today. One of them is on the right column. That's the feed loop feed loop chat. For questions, we'd like you to use the chat feature in the blue bar below the screen, which is the Zoom chat. And when you do put a question in there for the discussion group, please start it with a question mark. If you remember to do that, it would be helpful just for us to keep track of the questions. Um, feel free to use the chat on the feed loop chat on the right um, to participate by sharing thoughts and links and asking your questions amongst yourselves. Um, I think that's it. So I'm going to turn it over. Well, first I'm going to introduce the speakers and then I will turn it over to them. We have Deb Mater, who is the Director of Digital Education and Instructional Design at Bryan College of Health Sciences. Christy Plander, who is the Dean of Educational Development at Bryan College of Health Sciences. And Sasha Thackerberry, who is Associate Vice Chancellor of Learn learning experience in design and innovation at National University. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sherry. This is Christy. And um, we're going to start by sharing a little bit about our context. Uh, Deb and I are part of a small private healthcare college embedded within a medical center. Uh, we are, we serve about 800 students. And uh, so our office is uniquely small. And that offers us the afford affordability to oversee distance education, um, educational technology, instructional design, and faculty development. And it's because of that intersection that we were prompted to have an interest in the teaching and learning aspects of technological adoption. Sasha, you want to tell us a little bit about your contexts, plural? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, my current role, I am the Associate Vice Chancellor for Learning Experience Design and Innovation at National University, which um, encompasses actually multiple institutions that are merging right now. About 40,000 um, students between the two of those institutions fully online. And so I'm excited to be back in the private nonprofit space. Um, there I work with sort of the intersection, as Christy said as well, of um, course design development, program development, academic technology, and sort of um, hoping to expand some of the learning analytics piece um, and so, some sort of next-gen models as well as faculty SME training and, and some other pieces in there. Really great team that I just joined. So I am four weeks into my new position. Pre previously, I served as the Vice President for Online and Continuing Education at Louisiana State University, where we expanded programs and enrollment and um, brought, um, op like, created sort of an internal OPM across all of the LSU institutions. So in that context, it also included um, marketing, recruitment, retention, um, that sort of front end of the funnel, and then Salesforce, web design, all the technical stuff that went under sort of creating an OPM. But um, also have always been sort of an ed tech tech geek from back in the day. And so technology adoption, the good, the bad, and the ugly is um, near and dear to my heart. Deb, you have to, There we go. Uh, yeah. I think there I fixed it. <laughs> Thank you both very much. And as our participants can hear from all of our backgrounds, we've got a pretty wide variety and, and large expanse of experience. But I'm sure that everyone here can agree with us when we say that adopting technology has lots of considerations to be successful. Everything from privacy to security to accessibility and, and so much more. If you came to this session hoping for those resources, we're going to post some in the chat right now. Um, and Sherry's going to take care of that in the feed loop chat. And I'm going to do that in the Zoom chat so everyone has access to them. Um, and the, um, for the purposes of this meeting, however, we are going to focus on teaching and learning considerations. So just to set a framework for this session, we want to um, share some observations that we've made at our institutions. Many times, 
those that are requesting the technology, whether they be in the classroom or a fill a support role, have not necessarily identified the teaching and learning purposes of the text. I don't know about your institutions, but we have noticed in, um, a lack of resources for conducting a full and broad tech review. We also have a couple of jokingly well-loved terms for requests that come in about these um, tech project products that have not quite had that teaching and learning perspective reviewed. We like to call those um, shiny objects or technocentrism. I'm sure you all can identify with that with us. Given the roles at our organizations and our desire to see how others may be addressing these issues, we reached out to WCET and asked if we could engage the community in a roundtable discussion that might lead to such a resource that can help guide those processes. <clears throat> so that's where you all come in. So just a few housekeeping items before we get started. You all came to this session knowing that it was going to be a roundtable discussion at a WCET event. The WCET community is broad, diverse, and not at all shy. So we want to encourage you to speak up. You can use either chat or we welcome you to unmute. You can also, if you're feeling forward, turn your camera on and gesticulate wildly and we'll see you and call on you. Because of the discussion nature of this session, we would encourage you to turn on your camera as well. Oftentimes, it's easier to share when we can encourage each other with our nonverbal cues like head nods, smiling, and so on. We know that getting active participation from an adult conference participant is more challenging than herding cats sometimes. However, your contributions are very important and we look forward to those. We have divided this session into three mini discussions. So as you listen to us describe the phenomena that we have experienced, please share your stories. We would love to learn from your mistakes and your successes as both are equally valuable. Now on to the show, I'll pass it off to Christy and Sasha. Thank you, Deb. So the first uh, mini discussion is going to have an institutional focus to it. The name of the overall session is what I wish I would have thought about. And so the first thing we wish we would have thought about is that we wish we would have better differentiated between operational functions and teaching. So in other words, we need to help users understand there's a difference between the mechanics of education and the actual completion of education. Many technologies that are characterized for use of a technology in a classroom or online, of course, of course, don't actually relate to the act of education or learning. Um, we actually have an article that served as the basis for our planning for today's session um, that we will link for you in the chat and um, or at least to the abstract. And the authors say there appears to be some confusion between affecting changes in the means through which university teaching happens and instigating changes in how university teachers teach and learners learn. So um, the question for this mini discussion is how can we ensure that technology is having an impact on the process of teaching and learning in higher education? So as you think about that question, um, I'm going to actually um, ask my co-presenters for some examples of technologies that your institutions have adopted that um, are more operational in nature, even though they've been deemed educational technology. Uh, so something like um, an attendance taking tool, that's important and it serves a very important function in the classroom, um, but to call it an educational technology uh, might be a stretch depending on what the technology does. So. Uh, it might be only allowing maybe uh, freed up time for more education to happen rather than actually lending itself to the teaching and learning process. Or it might be cumbersome for the teacher to use and it might be taking time away from the educational process. So as we look about um, some examples to help our audience understand, uh, and also from an institutional lens, how are we allocating our budget? Have we, have we philosophically, strategically thought about how much of our budget is actually going to um, teaching and learning? Sasha, what are your thoughts about that? 
So that's that's an, an incredible set of questions. Yes. Um, one, of the, <laughs> one of the things that I find really interesting about this topic is that we really think about those things as as two different sort of even buckets of funding in our institution, like what is considered enterprise wide versus what is teaching and learning, right? And how niche are some pro products that we use that, yeah, it may have a legitimate teaching and learning component, but it's for like a single program. One of the examples of uh, technologies that are often sort of considered learning and teaching, but are truly administrative is things that are used to manage clinical experiences. So there are a suite of different services where you can have learners sort of log hours, put in notes, all those sorts of things, primarily for like clinicals or education or counseling, right? There, there are these types of tools where you have to track hours. Those really aren't learning and teaching technologies. Those are more, um, to some extent, um, for, for documentation, almost for accreditation purposes and to make sure the time is being spent, so almost a time tracking tool. And on the flip side of that, I think that there is a huge opportunity for us to exploit current operational technology for teaching and learning, right? So something as simple as um, if, you're, if your institution has um, O365, there are ways to integrate that with the learning environment, but then not just putting it out there as a, oh yeah, you can create a Word document. Oh, you could create a Word document collaboratively. Oh, we could, you know, do a um, sort of distributed presentation where everybody curates content and comments on it, and then we do sort of virtual gallery walk. There are a bunch of different ways to use what I would call sort of authentic technology tools in the teaching and learning process. And sort of one of the side benefits of those, as we all know, is, you know, you go into the workforce, and unless you're in our field, right, we spend time in LMSs, most folks go into the workforce and don't immediately use an LMS for like the core hub of everything they do. So thank goodness, uh, many good LMSs now have the ability to sort of plug in what I would consider authentic sort of workplace tools. And before we chase after a shiny object that maybe fills sort of like a niche, and sometimes it fills that niche particularly well, but how much are we resourcing it and what is the ROI on that? Before we do that, it's really good to look at sort of what are the suite of, of tools that you have now? You know, I think um, Phil Hill and Michael, Michael Feldstein made the point years and years ago, you can't like out Facebook, Facebook or out Twitter, Twitter, right? So how are you creating those tools um, and incorporating things that, yeah, aren't explicitly teaching and learning, but that people actually learn on in different ways all the time. Yeah, so the question, the essence of the question about um, differentiated between operational and teaching functions isn't necessarily a set up a dichotomy between operations and teaching. It's really to um, demonstrate that there needs to be focus on both and how can we be creative thinkers in um, kind of uh, making sure we're attending to the teaching aspects and then using our resources wisely because when you adopt a niche product you have to support the niche product you have to train on it and those kind of things and and again it might serve the purpose very well and that's um but it has to be considered so um the other thing i think to your point sasha is that um uh our students are already uh, using some of those consumer technologies like Google and Microsoft. And so sometimes you get uh, you, you just get better authentic learning if you're not uh, overloading the student with the cognitive load of having to learn something new. So there's that aspect as well. Um, not seeing too much from the audience yet, but that doesn't mean you're off the hook. We still want your input. So uh, whatever you're multitasking on right now, we'd love for you to put a question in the chat or help us out with some of your learnings because um, often the literature focuses more on success than mistakes, but we can learn from both. Deb, did you have uh, something that you wanted to add there? Yes, yeah, more just a question for our audience. I, I would love to hear what technologies are not um, necessarily teaching and learning focused, but you have had the opportunity to try to integrate them into the learning environment. 
um, whether that be a success or a failure, like you talked about, Christy. But I would just be interested to, to know. I think we, we all have experience with the Google Suite or the uh, Microsoft Suite and Zoom and, and all of those things. But I would be interested to hear some of the nuanced things that our audience have, has, it has experience with. I don't know if folks are gonna if folks are gonna raise hands. I see a couple people that are unmuted. Um, I don't want to necessarily take that as an invitation to pick on them. So if if you want to speak, please do. Just jump in or let us. Know. It looks like Jeff would like to share. So uh, this has been on my mind a little bit. Some of this um, online proctoring is uh, an electronic proctoring tool. Um, we, I ran an RFP process at the University of Wyoming. I'm at the University of Wyoming, by the way, and um, I'm actually in my basement, but I work normally at the University of Wyoming. Um, uh, and I ran an RFP process to obtain online proctoring solution because our outreach hub was dissolved and we used to do all of our proctoring in person. We used to facilitate it across the country for distance courses. And, um, and it's kind of a, I don't know, it, it's, I think online proctoring is one of those tools. It's not, an, in, it's, I don't think it's anything, I don't think it, it's an exciting tool that enhances learning. I think it's a, probably a necessity in some cases, although people might argue that you, you can design exams that don't need to be proctored, and I'm not disagreeing with that. Um, but uh it's it's and I've been kind of the point person because of that, even though it's sort of it flies in the face. I work in the Center for Teaching and Learning and it kind of flies in the face of our philosophy up there a little bit. But I'm sort of the point person and it just I don't know. I find I tell faculty don't use this unless you have to. But if you have to, it's probably a decent tool. You know, it's a, it's it works as well as any of them. The one we we chose honor lock out of that process. And they said, I think it works as well as any of them. It's not perfect. Um, don't use it unless you have to, but if you have to, go for it. But I don't know. It kind of no, leaves it's interesting. It and you know what's also interesting to me is we've actually seen in the pandemic some reversed usage of online proctoring. So has anybody had the take-home COVID test? I have. Um, so there's a, a way with that COVID take-home test. I don't know if y'all are using the same brand, but you, you have to like put in your code and then you have to wait and the person comes on, you have to show your ID and then like you break open the kit and you put, I mean, it's, it's actually like the lowest tech science experiment ever. Like anyone could do it. Literally my children could do it. But the point of like it being a proctored experience is something that I think a lot of people who aren't in higher ed, that's the first time they've had that sort of experience, that confirmation experience. And I wonder if this is one of those sort of unique cases where things are gonna go the other way, she's hoping. I have to go to the DMV soon, so I'm hoping for a future where they can just proctor my new license online or something like that. Um, but I do think there's some potential in that way of things that are really interesting, but 100% you're right. I think we look at that as a tool for teaching and learning, but it's really sort of an administrative function of like making sure you're the person you are, right? Identity verification. It's not even like a sort of turn it in academic integrity. It's really just a verification. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. We, um, thanks Russ for your question. Um, we, that, Jeff, um, that gets actually to right into the next uh, mini discussion. So I'm gonna lead with that. Um, we have, um, we have the second discussion uh, item is, I wish we would have fully formulated our pedagogical reasoning for technological adoptions. So again, same article I cited the first time, um, you know, more often than not, technology is being used to address an underdefined issue. Um, and we can all think of times when uh, teachers weren't able to describe or institutions weren't able to describe the teaching and learning issue or problem that needed to be solved when uh, adopting a technology. And I think uh, you know, Jeff, your question gets right at, or your, your contribution gets right at that. Like, let's step back for a minute. 
and talk about how you philosophically view exams and what are you trying to do. You know, we work in healthcare. There's um, lots of courses in our programs where, you know, they're testing clinical knowledge and those kinds of things. Our teachers are pretty adamant about um, exams and exam security. Uh, but could those skills be tested in other ways? And that's our faculty development hat on going, hmm, are alternate assessments something that you want to consider before you run to the technology? Or maybe the technology is something we adopt in the meantime, but also try to parallel that conversation with what is your pedagogy and, and how are you thinking through the educational problems? So um, the question here is, how do we help faculty or institutions overcome the shiny object syndrome? If we all knew that, we would probably not need this session. But um, <laughs> how do we do that and work to focus on the educational problem the technology will solve? Is this Sasha, I'll throw to you first. I could just keep, can, yeah. Yeah, you can. Um, <laughs> so I, I think one of the things that I'm really fascinated on how we can use more of in higher ed is some sort of business techniques that are adopted by uh, potentially more innovative businesses or, or some design thinking sessions about how do we get people in the room to actually brainstorm, like, what is the usage of this going to be? What are we hoping to get out of it? What do we think the impact is going to be for the students? Because sometimes, and, and I've been susceptible to this too, it's just a human thing. Like, I want that, that phone, you know, that phone that flips with the extra big screen. Like, I just want it because it's purdy. But I don't know, like, I haven't had any needs analysis. My phone works perfectly fine. You know, it's got all the bells and whistles. But this one is purdy. So I think that's one of the things that we don't, we don't examine our own inclinations or sort of um, preferences to see, okay, is this a valid use of significant institutional resources? Because never just the price tag is never just the price tag. Human hours cost money. So it's the support, it's the documentation, it's the help calls, it's the making sure it's used three years from now. So I think that that critical piece can also really help from a stakeholder standpoint because the current tools or options can be explored. And that 80-20 rule, that's legitimate. You're never going to find a perfect tool. But if you can find a tool that does most of the stuff and it can be really well supported, then go with that. You know, everything is not perfect. Um, Apollo 13, they managed to put square things and circular things together and make it work. And so figuring out how we even start thinking about what our return on investment for learning is for technical tools is really important. I think uh, interrogating all of the salesperson's claims very carefully is also another thing that we have learned. Like the salespeople say the technology will do miracles and then you're like uh oh, our yeah. data is not clean enough to perform that miracle <laughs> thank you right. for trying um i think that the gets engineers to the yes talk to the engineers of the product <laughs> as soon as possible in the sales cycle because they will interrupt the salesperson they will say actually <laughs> actually no it doesn't do that um, I think that gets at Russ's question that it was in the Zoom chat. Uh, what do people uh, do about faculty who adopt kind of something for their class? Uh, and um, in the probably the most ideal state of that, tell you beforehand, but probably the most accurate state of reality is they tell you after they've adopted it. And sometimes those aren't accessible, they violate privacy, or they're not user friendly. Uh, but they want to be able to use whatever technology they wish. Uh, Deb, do you want to talk about that at our institution? But then uh, we we welcome anyone else to talk about it at theirs because that's that's a big issue that we face. Uh, that's a huge issue. Um, and honestly, we haven't found a perfect solution to that issue. Um, we've run the gamut from we're going to lock down the LMS so you can't integrate anything at the course level without an administrator of the system. Um, but faculty have gotten around that by just providing links out to where they want to go rather than having an integration. So we've backed off from that. And um, the 
the most creative way that we have found, and it was totally by accident. Um, we have a faculty um, meeting, that's all of the faculty at the college, and they typically use a um, polling software within the um, video conferencing software in order to do votes and that kind of thing. Well, someone from our um, department did a short presentation and used a polling software, an independent polling software, um, to engage them in the training in that meeting. And faculty were lost. They didn't know where to go to participate. So it, it was an, an unintended but very educational process for our faculty to learn that, oh, maybe I do need to put some thought into the, the technologies that I'm using in my course and make sure that, I, that I'm not sending students to multiple places to do the same thing. And there needs to be continuity behind the, the technology choices that, that I make. Has that resulted in a huge shift in practice? No. <laughs> but I think that it was a very valuable learning experience for our faculty. Yeah, and you just can't catch all of the places. I see that in the in the chat, some folks are talking about, well, we have accessibility and privacy criteria built into our contract processes. Yes, that's absolutely best practice, but sometimes the faculty will hey, here's a thing, go try students. And so we have found kind of also success in um, offering up our services as a, we have what we call an adoption work group. So we have, you will receive an adoption work group sponsor to help you <laughs> through your product considerations and we'll help you work with IT uh, as you try to develop this product. And what we do, the very first thing we do is ask them, what is your use case? And so we then maybe broaden their perspective as to what uh, technologies they might want to consider. Anyone else want to speak to this topic? I think there's also some interesting frameworks that exist in the field, but thinking about it like as a proactive way to develop a whole e-learning ecosystem where you have functional abilities in sort of these different um, categories of engagement, like student to student engagement, faculty to student engagement, content delivery, um, assessment. You know, if you think about it as sort of functional buckets and build a, a, an ecosystem that meets those needs, it's a lot easier, I think, to bring folks into the fold and say, oh, you wanna do this thing fantastic look at this shiny thing we already have really pretty over here so you know if the the slicker we can sort of promote our own things in a way that you know evil genius for good sort of thing uh, people will do it to sell you stuff we should do it for adoption am i missing any contributions i want to move on too fast Okay, so the a final kind of discussion topic we have is um, really focused on the student. And it's an I wish we would not have used technology to replicate status quo broadcast teaching methods. There's a lot packed into that statement, so I'll kind of unpack that. But um, I think as a community, we need to more thoughtfully consider how often we use technology to replicate teaching methods that maybe aren't the most impactful for students instead of using it to deepen the learning. So uh, when, for example, doing research for this session, one of the things we came across was a lot of research on uh, educational technology adoption. And one of the, the sort of um, lines of um, analysis that the researchers were doing was um, slideware. And that made sense when you looked at it, but I was like, slideware, you know, like what, PowerPoint, like what, <laughs> you know? And so I think um, it just shows that despite all of the technological advances, um, teaching in higher education, um, same article again, has um, remained fundamentally unchanged, uh, was the quote. And research shows that a relationship between technology selection and faculty's pedagogical deployment 
um, such that teaching focused teachers use technology to replicate or supplement the broadcast of information, whereas learner focused teachers use technology to deepen student learning and foster inquiry. Um, what's interesting is um, teaching focused teachers prefer broadcast methods and students also will tell you they prefer broadcast methods because it's not a lot of work. It's passive. And so um, how do we, you know, break the cycle of um, passive learning and get people to the point where they're using technology to deepen student learning? So that's the discussion question for this um, section. Thank you, Missy. <laughs> Representing from Louisiana. Woo -woo. Yeah. So one of the one of the things that I'm really fascinated about for this question, um, if you don't mind me jumping in as I want to do, is is the preference of sort of some pieces of that broadcast um, based uh, learning. So here's here's sort of my pitch for that. So my husband, who is actually engaging in an MBA program right now, he is literally looking through all of the there is a, this massive student-generated spreadsheet where the students have co-created, I kid you not, they have co-created a Google sheet of every single class, what section it is taught by what professor, what are the teaching methods, what do they think are the strengths or weaknesses. And so folks use this, like thousands of students go in and use this to decide like what professors they want to take or what courses. And my husband's number one criteria is no group work. He does not want a course where he is going to have to rely on someone else to contribute part of those pieces. And I think that's an interesting lens um, from the perspective of someone who's a post-traditional learner, right? So my husband is 53. He's going back to to get his MBA after many, many years, <laughs> obviously. Um, and this is this is one of his core components is he does not want to have to organize with someone else, depend on someone else for anything. And ironically, what are some of those critical skills that everyone keeps talking about us needing to develop? Collaboration, um, you know, creative thinking, working in groups, the ability to, because, right, because as, as knowledge depends, de becomes more diffuse, expertise really becomes more diffuse. You have to work in teams to be super effective. So I think that that's just a really interesting uh, lens on it is what works from a deep learning part, which there was some of this this morning, right? Um, deep learning versus surface learning. What works for deep learning is not necessarily what works as a strategy for post-traditional learners. I will say though, there's been some interesting data on use of consumer technology and how people are consuming media. And one of the things that I'm really fascinated by is the amount of people that are now using podcasts, which has changed dramatically over the last 10 years. Like it used to be sort of a fringe activity. Now, literally, I think every adult I know, with a couple of exceptions, listens to podcasts. And this way of learning is, it's sort of like this, right? This could be just a podcast. It could be a conversation between experts, but it's not necessarily, so, so there's like, they're telling stories right? There's narratives, the true crime stuff. I'm not saying I'm a true crime aficionado whatsoever, but there's some true crime things, right? That are mainly narrative storytelling, very compelling. And then there are things that are discussions, um, political conversations, new developments in science, all sorts of like really interesting things. Um, but those are almost fly on the wall. So you're looking into an interaction. What it isn't is somebody like reading a textbook or doing a recorded PowerPoint. It is an interaction where you're a fly on the wall, right? Or it is a story that you're being told that is emotional because you don't want to die at the hands of a serial killer, right? So there's lots of different sort of ways to think about broadcast. Like how do we get deep engagement in the broadcast experience. And I think we have to look to what people are doing to learn when they're not in class. And it's just really interesting to me that we we assume that delivery of education should be, it should be us pushing out a series of facts, knowledge, and like even super really well-designed media presentations. 
Well, if I look at like what I can get lost in on YouTube, it's like the doing of stuff, right? Like people can make like furniture out of cardboard. It's amazing. But I get to like watch them do this interesting thing. They don't know I'm there. So I think that's just a really um, lens that we could learn from about how to do broadcast in a really compelling way. And it's not necessarily having a whole team of videographers. You know, some of the most, look at, look at Instagram, look at TikTok. I mean, my God, it's like a few seconds of something and like 5 million people watch it. Well, I have learned how to do some hairdos on TikTok is what I'm talking about. You can't, you can't tell from today, but very significant learning occurs probably in the wrong <laughs> disciplines, but doesn't mean we can't use that tool for good. Precisely. Very good. I have a question. Yeah. I, I, I teach a class. I teach a capstone class in a degree program that everybody that gets this degree has to go through this class and or, and group work is required. I have to teach. I have to have a group project in there. And I think it's interesting that it's called group work in a classroom and it's called teamwork in the office. And team is a way more positive thing, I think. I, I don't know, group work, I appreciate that students find that repugnant. And I and I have my students all talk about their experiences in, in group work and how they might make it better themselves. And, and I keep thinking, should I call this a team project instead of a group project in my class? Uh, I think this I think, is a diversion from the actual discussion. But. Oh, that's all right. I think um, that makes me think that if it were me, I would interrogate uh, yes, group and team are synonyms, but what are some of the deeper similarities and differences? Like on a team, it's going to last more than a semester. On a team, I, you know, I rely on, um, Deb's my teammate, I rely on her as my, like, second arm, you know, so, and I know the strengths and weaknesses, and so interrogating some of those underlying considerations and concepts, um, and actually having your students discuss those underlying concepts might help them buy in. I mean, it's worth a try. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. I thought, and I think I'd rather be a member of a team than a group, kind of. But um, but you're right, though. I think a team, you you know each other's, yeah, strengths and weakness. There are some differences, but I just find that interesting anyway. <laughs> no, I think I think also there's a certain level of accountability that if anyone is in here from an instructional design background, it's actually not um, it, it's not easy to create a group project whereby folks are really um, interdependent in a way that could, that doesn't penalize an individual member of the group. I think a lot of folks are doing more for. Um, in terms of grading each other and assessing each other. But I found even when I teach at the graduate level that folks still have trouble following some, some sort of basic descriptive rubrics. Um, and so it can take some time, which is where actually Christy and, and Jeff, I think it's a fantastic idea if you're in a cohort program to develop a group dynamic over multiple courses. I think it's a heck of a hard thing to do in an eight week course, right? Or an accelerated 7.2 week course. It's a challenging thing to do. I don't know if any of our fantastic facilitators could, ah, I've been enabled for screen sharing just because I live by memes. I think this would be a little bit amusing for everyone. Can you see my board panda? There are some killer memes about group projects online um, and, this, if this is what we're teaching our students about, uh, about teams in the workplace, we have to be very cautious um, about what we do. But if anyone needs an afternoon uh, laugh, definitely go look up group project memes because it just gets funnier from there and a, a little bit less appropriate too. So I think that was um, probably very a, a very um, appropriate version of a meme for our, our topic. Um, one, one thing I, one ahead, thing I yeah. think of in my in my class is my class should be really successful at group projects because every student, when I ask them about their experience in group projects, 
they've always carried the entire load. So if all 20 of you have carried the entire load, you should be in great shape, right? None of them ever say, you know what? I just deferred and I learned nothing. I think this may also have to do with some um, need for additional metacognitive exercises in education, whereby we actually teach people to be self-aware and to be able to assess their true level of effort and contribution. Um, but that is a very funny thing, Jeff. I was once in a, a training whereby um, the, the trainer said, I want everyone to raise your hand if you think you know, you're probably in the 80% or more mark of your field. Like, just raise your hand. And like, of course, like everybody in the room, they were like, most of you are incorrect because <laughs> we can't all be in like, you know, the top 20, the 80th percentile or over, which I thought was a, a, a very interesting sort of perspective. Um, how do we get ourselves even to know what we're strong at and what we're not so great at? Yeah, and I think uh, to the point in, yeah, to the points in the going on in the chat too, like um, asking during the adoption phase, how can we use this to deepen learning? And uh, Deb had mentioned in prepping for the session, she's like, I think I'm gonna change my question. I normally ask, what's your outcome? And she said, I think I'm gonna start asking, how are you gonna use this to deepen learning? Um, Sandy, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but uh, it looks like you're ready to share something. Yes, I'm actually very excited about the dialogue. And, you know, to your point, um, I've, I've taught uh, for, for 20 years. And one of the things that I realized, I think, in the engagement of uh, group work, to your point, was to kind of address that in the beginning. So before they were assigned groups, I would ask specifically if they enjoy group work. Of course, to your point, a lot of people said, no, not really. And we made it essentially a part of the lesson as to why they didn't enjoy group work. We talked about not showing up on the presentation day, you know, what kind of feelings that evokes for your other group members. And then also, you know, uh, basically roles that people play in groups. Is it the timekeeper kind of being bossy? <laughs> Was it um, the jokester constantly being on your phone? And I found when I started off with that approach, um, before anything really happened, that the group work, uh, or to his point, teamwork, um, it was was definitely much more effective. And I think people were had, I think, a, a greater sense of the emotional intelligence of their group. <laughs> so um, I started implementing that uh, as a, a regular piece of before really. Uh, uh, assigning that work and kind of helping think through and being able to say what they really wanted to say before it was connected to a group challenge um, or issue. Uh, and then I also wanted to speak to um, the technology. So I know one of the things that we're trying to certainly work on is how do we really look at what technologies that we're going to utilize? Is it one campus? Is it you know, one area, uh, one school. And so we really moved more towards the model of uh, effort. We're saying the impact and the effort. Um, we work closely with our creative services and will it take them three weeks to create a video, make it accessible and seven people are going to look at it. So I think kind of really looking at um, what is the impact that we're seeing with the product and the ask of what uh, like our director says, what do they really want people to think, feel, and do? And looking at, is a video really the effective way to do that? Um, are we making them just to make them because it's for one area? So we've really kind of looked at if it's going to be a high effort project or technology or something we're implementing, it certainly needs to have a high impact across the colleges. I want to. I want to wild card it. Is it Shani? I hope I said that right. Oh, Shani. Shani. Okay. Yes. Um, I want to wild card it based on based on what you just said. I think that um, has anyone here, and you can use either the the chat and put a plus one, or you can raise your hand, or you know, however you want to designate. It. Has anyone here gotten halfway through a project, like a video project or an implementation project? And it ends up taking three times as long as you thought it was, 
it was going to be three times as expensive and you were going to get less out of it than you thought you were going to get. Um, if anyone has lived that before, uh, let us know. And then if you have lived that before, how many of your institutions chose to pull the plug? I hazard a guess very few. One of the things that we are traditionally pretty poor at as an industry is um, saving ourselves from loss cost fallacy, which is when you're heading down a road and you've invested quite a bit in it, and you're like, oh, but there's already tens of thousands of dollars in a year of effort. Yes, it keeps getting more, but we have to do it. We're this far invested. We have to also help our institutions, our faculty, our teams understand that sometimes you got to pull the plug. Figure out what you learn from the project, pull the plug, and move on to something that's going to be more impactful. Because deciding what you're going to sunset or what you're going to get rid of or what you're not going to put more wasted effort into, that is all real value that you could be focused on a different initiative or a different technology or just a deeper implementation of current technology that would be more impactful for students. So I love how you really conceptualize that as impact and effort. Um, to get to that scope. And then if you're not getting what you're, what you need to be getting out of it, uh, really figuring out how are we gonna, how are we gonna pull it and, and, and redirect that effort. We've got quite a bit of input going on in the chat. A lot of people are resonating with what you're, you're talking about there, Sasha, that doing those um, activities that feel fruitless. <laughs> is sometimes a, a part of our daily life. Um, I do also see that, um, let's see if I can get my scroll bar to work here. Russ chimed in that he was in a, a group and advocated for that kind of let's stop the process um, activity. And the result is now he's not in that group anymore. <laughs> I don't know, Russ, if that was by design or by choice. But, it, but either way, that is a, a professional impact that, that we have to think of. Um, one of the things I'm kind of hearing that, that I don't know that anyone ha has tried this, and if you have, I would love to hear about it. Good, Russ, I'm glad it was your choice. <laughs> That's always helpful. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm hearing some connections between the, the metacognitive activities that we're asking of students to do and kind of how important that reflection piece of, of everything that, that we ask students to do is. How many people have built that reflection or metacognitive activity into their adoption process? I'm sitting here thinking about all of the technologies, the one-off things that we've helped faculty put together in their courses. I don't know that we have ever circled back around two semesters, three semesters in to say, hey, one, are you still using this? And two, what were your thoughts on it? Did it help? Did it achieve? The goal that you were trying to achieve. I'm wondering if that's something that any uh, anyone else has had experience with. I, I've been in a position where you create you've created things at, at sort of great investment cost uh, to find out that just no one was using it a, a year later. Um, and, and that's only sort of accidental through the grapevine. So, and, and this is where uh, another thing that we get into with technology adoption is once something has been piloted, it sort of automatically becomes part of operations and it just continues to live um, despite the fact that you're probably not even measuring impact. Uh, but it can't get a little dicey from a cultural perspective. I got a lot of pushback once on a, on a video tool that we were going to implement that had a lot of, no, it did have some great unique features, but it was based on Flash. And it also had some um, duplicative features to synchronous web conferencing. And I didn't think it was probably the best investment because again, support, documentation, cost, all those good things. But one program really, really wanted it. And um, it wasn't a terrible product at all. I'm just not sure it was a mission critical product. Um, but we ended up we ended up adopting it. I don't know if they're still using it. Actually, I should find out. That would be a good that would be a good 
question to ask. A lot of the work that's been done in this space has, has been to develop checklists. So you can do a checklist for do does a certain technology meet uh, accessibility requirement A and B and C? Does it meet privacy concern A and B and C, network, data protection, all of those things? Um, one of the things we were kind of hoping to come out of the session was some adoption criteria for a similar checklist around the idea of the educational learning. So creating that deeper meaning, working on our pedagogy. Um, so we would love some ideas from the audience. Uh, we have um, time left to talk about um, how would we um, set up criteria so that we frame it and we keep our eye on the goal. You know, I think sometimes because we have the criteria for other things, we look through those criteria and once it meets all those, we're good. And uh, I think useful criteria for adoption with regard to the educational purpose would be helpful. So what are some of the questions you all ask of your faculty or your other staff members when a new technology product, product is, is brought to your attention? Uh, Vernon, would you mind elaborating on return on learning and the concepts there and how you might use that if possible? So it's sort of like a pop quiz and, and folks probably don't have microphones set up too. So Vernon, feel free to interrupt me at any point here. Um, one of the things that we did at, at LSU was put together sort of a request form. And part of, the, part of the point of the request form was to provide some of those nudges, like things to think about, like some, some very specific, um, like mechanical things, like how many classes do you intend on using it in? What is the enrollment of those classes? You know, is it just going to be you or is it going to be people from your department? Have other people expressed interest in it? If so, who are those people? Um, what technologies are you aware of that we have that are the closest? So sort of prompting them to think through, oh, you know, we do have this other video tool. Maybe I don't need an extra one. So the, that sort of intake process provides some of those questions going through. One of the things that we've seen is it's it's not even always the new technology. It's it's my favorite technology. I want to keep using the clicker I'm super comfortable with, right? And so some of those are even things like a school doesn't need like, multiple contracts with multiple clicker companies, especially when you can do it all on your phone now anyways. So those are, I think, one of those pieces to have some sort of process whereby the process itself nudges that sort of thinking that you need in the decision-making process. So those would be some of the things that I would consider first, um, you know, it, size of impact, right? And depth of impact, so breadth and depth. In the feed loop chat, Amy has shared, um, I've been thinking a lot about a rubric for assessing new tech for exploration far in advance of adoption. We had success for that um, when we um, had a request for audience interaction software. Uh, we didn't have something like that at our institution. And so we really made a conscious effort to have the program that was asking about us asking us about it, um, do a pretty extensive exploratory process for well, what's your use, what are your use cases? And we did um, more than one pilot so that they could compare and contrast. And um, it was uh, unusual in that um, our pilots didn't all end up in adoption, like Sasha said, they sometimes do. Uh, Vernon has added there is an R&D time. Um, sorry, my chat's moving quick. Um, and a need to show the value of new technology. Does it scale beyond the pilot? That's a great question. Can it be used across the college? Who benefits? And the evidence of impact, evidence of learning. Um, and to define what success looks like beforehand. Yeah, perfect. Just like we would do with our students and their learning outcomes. 
Um, yes, it makes it easier to sell to boards and administration. And I think keeping administration uh, mindful of thinking about, uh, you know, your budget is going to a lot of operational technology over here. How about the teaching and learning piece? It's yes, we have the LMS, but what do we have with the LMS now to to enhance learning? Um, yeah, keep those uh, comments coming. Deb, anything else you see there? No, but we've just got some really good ideas. They're, they're not technically checklist items, but I think that through further conversation and consideration, we definitely could curate, start to curate something that, that could be helpful in this arena. And if, if you all engage in conferences like I do, and about 10 o'clock tonight, you're going to think, oh, this would be a really good idea. We would love to hear from you. You're welcome to connect with any of us through the Feed Loop app and, and continue this conversation as your brain continues to, to percolate on it. Okay, as we wrap up in the last few minutes, any closing thoughts? Um, Deb, we'll start with you and then Sasha and close it out. Well, first of all, thank you everyone for your participation today. You, you have really come through with us and engaging and, and providing us insights from your um, vantage point in this arena. Um, I, I think we all can agree that this is an easy thing to talk about, but a very difficult thing to deploy. <laughs> So I, I am excited to hear all of the um, various avenues that you all are taking in, in regards to how do you have these conversations with the folks at your institutions. Because we all know that, that the best way to impact a change is through conversation rather than mandate. So we appreciate the work that you're doing on this and your willingness to share with others and, and for your participation today. Thank you, and I want to thank Deb and Christy for inviting me along as well. I really appreciate it. Um, I think from a parting thoughts perspective, my favorite things that I'm going to be thinking about now are um, how do I incorporate more things like podcasts and sort of conversations, incorporating more conflict, incorporating more sort of fly on the wall sort of um, broadcast pieces, but then also what, how can I look at, we use Brightspace, how can I look at um, some of the native tools that we have to integrate right into Brightspace and encourage those as a means, because they are those authentic tools. So um, those are a couple of the things, some of which I actually spoke to, so I'm making myself think, as well as other people making me think, but it's just given me a lot to, to sort of chew on. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate having the chance to speak with y'all. Thanks, Sasha. We uh, knew we needed to have some diverse uh, institutional uh, experiences and certainly uh, the size diversity of our institutions is there when we talk to Sasha. So um, I'm just gonna leave the, 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 the audience with our three I wish statements again so that they can continue to think about things that might help in developing resources. So the three I wish statements were, I wish we would have differentiated between operation functions and teaching. I wish we would have fully formulated our pedagogical reasoning. And I wish we would have not used technology to simply replicate status quo teaching methods. So thank you all. Your participation has been great. Sherry, you've come back on. Do you want to close this out? Sure. Thank you. I just want to thank everyone for attending and, um, and a special thanks to our discussion leaders. I believe the survey has probably popped up on your screen, so be sure to fill that out. Um, speakers enjoy feedback. And be sure to join us at one of our, we have five sessions coming up here in, in 15 minutes. So pick one that you like, and we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you.